Here we go. Hello, this is Elsa. And I want to talk about something that grabbed me the first time I saw it, the 12 Rules for Survival. And a really important thing about Lawrence Gonzalez, 12 Rules, he had all kinds of people in extreme situations, a shipwreck, an airplane crash, also diagnosed with a life-threatening illness. You might think dealing with an illness is different from dealing with a shipwreck, but he found that the survivors used the same rules, or anyway, he saw the same rules, and they resonated with me. So I'll go over them one at a time. And I'll pay a special attention to the first because that's what stuck with me right away. And I've thought a lot about it. Rule one, perceive and believe. You might think, well, it's really obvious. You know, I've crashed in an airplane. Everyone's dead except for me. Um, shouldn't be that hard to perceive it. Or I've had a life-threatening diagnosis. Well, one of the things that we know, <clears throat> looking around, in terms of this pandemic, most people did not perceive that anything was happening except what the government and the media were saying. And yet there was lots of evidence that those of us who were looking could find it. Over and over, so many things, in fact, the mainstream thing is not to bother perceiving. They jump ahead to believing. They hear something, there's a deadly illness. People are dropping dead all over. We've got to have a state of emergency. And they immediately believe. If someone takes a space between hearing and believing, that's where perceiving enters in. Or if someone just doesn't hear. For example, a very interesting person on um, what happened on 9-11, Judy Wood. Her thing was when she's looking at something, she doesn't hear. So most people heard the newscaster say, airplanes have just crashed, there's this, there's that. She wasn't paying attention. She was just looking and what she saw was something different from the words that were being said. So perceiving is not such an obvious thing. But then I was gonna congratulate myself, like here I am and here the minority is, we go around perceiving. But actually when I looked back at it, I went, I have had an incredible journey in terms of perceiving. I can start 30 years ago, or I can start in 2006 with Islam. That's easier. I started perceiving in 2006. So it wasn't around 9-11. It was around the Danish cartoon and the massive marches and everything that happened. Millions of Muslims marching, embassies burned, some people killed, etc. Muslims were upset. They were offended. It didn't compute for me. So the first thing was I had my own ethical rules. Most people were going, this is just fine. The, you know, the, the you know, small wonder the Muslims are upset, et cetera. This is all, it makes all perfectly good sense. Um, and they went, we shouldn't be offending. But I had my own built-in ethical rules and I had grown up with um, you know, lots of people getting offended about all kinds of stuff. Um, but the word F-U-C-K was a word that my mother wouldn't tolerate. In fact, when I was eight, I asked her what the word was because little boys on the street were using it. I, my mother told me not to say the word. So I grew up thinking my mother was pretty ridiculous about that. And that you don't, uh, you know, that my mother got offended had nothing to do with whether or not I should use the word. And I kept my ethical sense. So I didn't believe the whole evaluation. But on the other hand, I didn't immediately perceive there was a problem with Islam. That was when I wrote a post already in 2006 saying, you know, the prophet would be really upset. And someone wrote back to me and saying, no, he wouldn't have been. He wasn't a very nice guy. And they sent me all kinds of quotes. Okay. I very quickly picked up there are problems with Islam. Congratulations to me, aren't I wonderful? But I didn't know about communism. I didn't know about infiltration. I didn't know about the climate hoax. It took me years until I found out, a, you know, could see that because I bought the mainstream narrative on that. 
And in none of them was I perceiving it was anything beyond Islam or beyond Islam or beyond the communism. So the elite, who are the elite, all of that, I didn't perceive any of it. So I had to learn, it's not so easy, all this perceiving thing. Most recently with the Truth Summit, partly I've learned to perceive a lot more about 9-11, but there's other perceiving that also happened. And that is, I interviewed Dr. Anna Mehocha, who was looking at what's happening with the blood of the vaccinated. And about half a year ago, she went, oh my God, it's not just the vaccinated. Now it's the unvaccinated too. So she was seeing spreading or shedding or whatever it was. And then she interviewed two people whom I also went on to interview, Alana Freeland and um, Celeste Solem. Celeste Solem, I'm just watching her webinar, Synthetic Biology. And she explains in detail how our DNA, mine and yours, can be, and according to the planners, will be changed so we will no longer be ourselves. I won't know it as it's happening if this does happen. I'll be taken over. I'll be colonized. I didn't know that. So what I'm seeing is that this perception thing is more complicated than just plain perceive. Because in fact, many of the things that we need to perceive are not things that are visible. Airplane crash, boom, I'm in the Andes, there's snow all around, everyone else is dead. Okay, it's not that challenging. I mean, it is challenging, getting out of there is really challenging. But the thing is that the what's it's really simple to perceive compared to where we are, where most of the things that are going on are invisible. I, they're mediated by the media, even by the uh, alternative media. Are there viruses or aren't there? I can read all kinds of sources. So perceiving ends up being something that really involves all my faculties of thinking and being logical and being open to more research. And so this perceive and believe is a lot more complicated and it's not one like perceive and believe because the mainstream thing is if you're you know, brain numbed or whatever word you want to call it you listen and you believe they're often locked you can't put facts in you're a conspiracy theorist here the believing we need to do isn't like the believing i'm in the andes everyone else is dead how do i get out of here the believing needs to be a loose believing i'm evaluating are there viruses or not I'm listening to Celeste Solem, but first of all, I don't have a science background. And part of the time I'm going cross-eyed listening to this and falling asleep. But at the end, does it make sense and how much sense? So I'm having to stretch myself. And then before I believe her, though she's a specialist, I'm gonna check other people. But are they all from a little clan? And what is this little clan? So I think rule number one, all of you, I don't know how you are about perceive and believe. I think it's an incredibly, incredibly important rule. And by this way, in terms of perceiving, another thing is what opportunities do I have for action? Many people get into talk circles. They pass on their stuff to eight friends or 40 friends or 50, whatever, to a little group. And that's where they get stuck. And they're often passing on very similar information day after day. It's the Marburg virus, it's the Omega virus, it's the Dingdak virus, et cetera. So I'm in some of those circles and I see some people are like on a little hamster wheel of information. What that tells me is that they don't perceive other opportunities for action. So part of perceiving for me is looking around. What can I do? And one of the actions that I chose to do half inspired was do this truth summit. Now, nobody was telling me that. Now I happen to love summits. I find I get concentrated information. So, but nobody's done it in my area and in, in the truth area. So, um, but I'm always looking around for what can I do? And I don't mean I 
always know what to do. And if I go back to 2006, it took me six years to really get active around Islam. I was starting to get upset around 2006. By 2009, I was quite aware, but I didn't want to do what everyone else that I was reading was doing, like put out the news. Well, Robert Spencer's already doing that. Um, Pam Geller's already doing that. And those two are still going strong and fantastic. But who was I to replicate that or to you know do something similar? It took me till 2012. And in fact, what I did is I had the idea, I'll do a, a summit, a truth summit. And already it was like the summit I have just done. Who are these people? Who are these people who have seen the truth about Islam and are doing something about it as opposed to others? So anyhow, perceive and believe. I'll be going through the other rules a lot more quickly because I didn't chew on them in the same way, but I'll go over them and you can see what's important to you and where do you get stuck. Okay, I'll just run over the others because that's, you know, and maybe we'll go into greater detail on another time when we get together. The second one is don't panic, stay calm. It doesn't mean don't be angry, it's use your anger, use it to fuel what you're doing. But panic is useless. If that person, the sole survivor in the Andes had gone off in panic, screaming, running into the snow, it wouldn't have done her any good. So it is, don't be fueled by fear. Don't freeze. Use that in a calm way. And if you're calm, how do you use anger calmly? Okay, we're still with that survivor in the Andes. Think, analyze, and plan. Think about what's going on. I'm being told that there is a deadly virus and I don't know a single person who has had it. I don't know anybody who knows anybody either. Think about it, analyze and make some plans about the virus. The plan I made is I wanna find out how to treat it. So I was searching everywhere and I found out on April 2nd, that somebody had a very successful treatment. And that's in fact where the whole story fell to pieces for me because there was a remedy. It was made illegal. Doctors would lose their license if they prescribed it in Canada. So I went something really horrible, something evil was going on. Okay, so think about things, analyze what you're getting and then make a plan. Okay, given that something horrible is happening, what can I do? The one thing I did is I created a little tiny website. It never, I'm not a doctor, et cetera. And it was speed the spread dot info, speed the spread of information. So it was, I wanted to get this information out. I wanted other people to know what I knew. And the thing about the plan, it leads right into rule four, take correct, decisive action. Don't stay dithering. I did that with Islam for six years. I've learned, and I think the thing is, the more you're in things, the more quickly you come to taking decisive action. And then so many of us say, who am I? I only have four friends or eight friends, and what can I do? It's really nothing much. The next thing, step five, is celebrate your success. If you reached one family member, fantastic. If you found a group that you belong to that is right for you, fantastic. Anything that's successful, celebrate the success. There are 8 billion of us. So I did a truth summit. So what? No, no. Oh, my God. It's fantastic. And by the way, I got a lot of praise and I love it because it's other people are celebrating. They got something and they're letting me know it was success. Celebrate it. Don't diminish your success. If we're in it together, add our successes up. Next, be a rescuer, not a victim. How can we be a rescuer? Well, we're reaching out to other people. We're helping other people. And if I'm doing things 
I'm not doing it so that I have a better chance of survival. I might in fact have a better chance of survival if I didn't let anyone know about me, if I stayed hidden, if nobody knew who I was and I just you know, got my stockpile of food and found a place somewhere in the dark forest and uh, an underground cave and pulled the hatch down. That might be if I was only concerned about myself. But to be a rescuer means I'm reaching out. This whole thing about the Truth Summit, yes, I love talking to those people, but I was trying to reach not just those people, I had a great time talking to them, but all the people I reached and the people I might reach with another summit. So it's be a rescuer, help other people, not just yourself. Um, and then when you're doing that, it's really easy to say, my God, isn't it awful? Oh, yay, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, all that kind of thing. Next thing is enjoy the survival journey. I had a lot of pleasure interviewing people. I had, sometimes I really got fed up, I must say, because it was a long night, night, all this stuff. And, I, and my adult self sometimes went, oh, what the hell? But so much of the time, I was enjoying that. Um, there was so much pleasure in all of that. And I've already done an interview for the next summit. And now I'm enjoying this. So enjoy the survival journey. Enjoy whatever you're doing. And the next thing is not only enjoy it, Look outward and see the beauty of other people, other efforts of being together with like-minded people. See the beauty in it. And I know he quotes a Holocaust survivor who was able to have many moments of joy in the Holocaust. Uh, one thing I'm remembering not from here, uh, from Eli Wiesel who did Man's Search for Meaning, he talks about himself and other people in the concentration camp looking up and seeing this amazingly beautiful sunset and seeing the beauty of that moment. So they were able to celebrate that beauty, enjoy it. Next one. I see so many people saying, I think it's too late. We can't do it. Next one. Believe you will succeed. I was born optimistic. I don't mean seriously, because I have like a problem being realistic because I so much believe we can do it. And apparently some people are, are get double of um, do, get, do goodism. Others, I think I got a double dose of optimism. But even if you didn't get it or you have a double dose of pessimism, wor do whatever you need to believe you will succeed. I'm remembering something from Ford who had many shortcomings, but I like this quote. If you believe you can, or you believe you can't, you are right. Well, I'd rather be right about believing I can than believing I can't. And the next one is not everyone survives. Surrender. You got stuck in the World Trade Center buildings. Not everyone survives. Surrender to whatever is. So as opposed to, again, going into panic or whatever it is, um, and it is, he says, it's resignation without giving up. It is survival by surrender. Here's one survivor. I thought I would probably die out there among those boulders. The thought didn't alarm me. The horror of dying no longer affected me. And here's the Tao Chi. Teo Chi, Teo Chi Ching, which I always pronounce badly. The rhinoceros has no place to jab its horn. The tiger has no place to fasten its claws. Weapons have no place to admit their blades. Now, what is the reason for this? Because on him, there are no mortal spots. So if you can both believe in success, but surrender to whatever's going to happen, you have no mortal spots. Next, you do whatever is necessary. A lot of us don't like the things that we're asked to do, the, what we can do, etc. The most extreme thing I heard of is somebody was trapped on a mountainside and a rock had fallen on one hand. There's no way he, and he bashed his other hand against the boulder 
He didn't do anything. The boulder was on the hand. The man cut his hand off, amputated his own hand, and survived. That was the goal. He had a choice, dying with his hand under the boulder and surviving. I don't know what this means to many people, but I know it means look outside your comfort zone. I interviewed Diana West. Where is she living? In Vermont, and she has chickens. She's been a lifelong city dweller. What made her do that? I think it could be part of do whatever is necessary, and she's learned cities may be dangerous. I'm not saying everyone should do as she did, but I am saying check around and see what you do have to or might have to do for survival. And the last rule is never give up so that, yes, surrender, but don't give up. Um, and the thing he gives, and I didn't pay much attention to Apollo 13 where the oxygen tank exploded and it was just about doomsday. But with one step and another and another, they survived. And even when the disaster happened, instead of giving up, the captain on board the Apollo 13 went, well, there's something I can do right now. I can relay information about what is going on here. I can give them every single bit of information I can. And so instead of going into panic or despair, you went into, I will do what I can. And it ended up working out. So those are the 12 rules. And now what I'm going to do is I am going to, 